you for meeting us in this space and in this place. God, continue to drag our hearts to the place where we can fully see your face, that your glory would be revealed to us and that your face would shine upon us, that it would bring peace to our hearts, and that um, more than anything, we would clothe ourselves in love so that we become people of love, that we become more like you so that the rest of the world would know how good you are. Thank you, thank you. All those people said, amen. Amen. Love you guys. You can be seated. Amen. Thank you, music team. That was, again, well done. We have good worship here. Good morning, church. Good to see you guys today. Look at you. You guys look good, man. If, if you could see you, you'd say, we look good. <laughs> if you have ever heard the call of Jesus Christ in your life, if you have ever heard him beckon you to come, if you ever sensed him to say, just, just come away with me and see, and you've responded, yes, I will follow you, then you might be a disciple. I say might be a disciple because if all you ever do is say yes, but you not, don't follow that up with activity, spending time in his presence, learning to become like him, learning to do as he did, then it is very likely that you're a disciple in name only. And if you've been truly born again and you are living as a disciple in name only, then I suspect, and I suspect I'm right about this, that your Christian life has been and continues to be an exercise in frustration. Last week we talked about the idea of passing through the narrow gate, uh, that narrow gate of, of uh, salvation. But then remaining near that gate, uh, not traveling very far down the path that Christ has beckoning us to follow. Uh, we've said that Christ's likeness is possible, but that, and we know this, it's not natural. It doesn't always come easy. Part of being a disciple of Christ is that we become like Him. Becoming like Him requires that once we pass through the narrow gate of salvation, once you and I have responded to Jesus' call to follow him, to become more and more like him requires that we continue to travel down the difficult way that he leads. Amen? Part of understanding what the life of a disciple should look like, I think requires understanding the kingdom of God as it pertains to life here in this broken world. And in the book of Matthew, we're told that after Jesus puts the devil in his place out there in the wilderness, he makes his way back to Capernaum beside the sea there in Galilee, where he officially begins his earthly ministry. And we read in Matthew 4, 17, from then on, Jesus began to preach. And here's what he preached. Repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now we know that scripture teaches that repenting of our sins and turning to God is that passing through the narrow gate of salvation, but what of this kingdom of heaven that Jesus speaks of? Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is near. Some translations say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, this morning I want to investigate, maybe just touch the tip of the iceberg because there's lots to say about this. And we will say more about it. But I want to investigate what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ within the kingdom of God. Because I submit to you this morning that discipleship is where we can actually see the kingdom. Where we can actually see the kingdom of God advance in us and also 
to advance the world around us, through us. Now first let me say a few words about the kingdom. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven was primary in Jesus' teaching. It permeated everything that he taught his disciples in the first century. He, he talked way more about the kingdom than he ever talked about the church. We just saw that he began his three-year earthly ministry by talking about the kingdom, and it was his primary focus during his time on earth. And so I think we should pay attention to this. The word kingdom, as translated from the Greek, is the word basilia, which means the realm in which a sovereign king rules. And all through the New Testament, the word kingdom consistently refers to the rule of Christ in the hearts of believers, since for the time being... Christ's kingdom is not of this world physically. We are told in the book of Revelation that one day there will be a literal, physical kingdom on this earth. But for now, that kingdom lives in our hearts. And so this is why Jesus said the kingdom is near or the kingdom is at hand. It also, he was implying that I have, I'm, I'm bringing it. And because I'm here, the kingdom has arrived. And so in his famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to seek first First, seek the kingdom of God. And that really doesn't need any interpretation by me. It is as direct as it sounds. We are to seek the things of God as a priority over all the things of the world. And primarily, it means we are to seek the salvation that is inherent in the kingdom of God because it is of greater value than all of the world's riches. Does this mean that we should neglect the reasonable and daily duties that help sustain our lives? It does not mean that. But for the Christian, there should be a difference in attitude toward those things. And if we are taking care of God's business as a priority, seeking His salvation, living in obedience to Him, sharing the good news of the kingdom with other people, then He will take care of our business as He promised. And if that's the arrangement, if that in fact is the arrangement that God has made with you and I, then what in the world are we worrying about? Why are we worrying about anything? But how do we know if we are truly seeking God's kingdom first? Well, I think we know, but there are some questions that we could ask ourselves if we really need to do this. Things like, where do I primarily spend all my energy? Is all my time and money spent on material stuff and activities that will certainly perish? Or is my time spent practicing the way of Christ and striving to become more like Him in all of my ways? Believers who have learned to truly put God first may then rest in His promise and all these things will be given to you as well. So God has promised to provide for his own. He has promised to supply every need that you and I have. But his idea of what we need is often different than our idea of what we need, isn't it? His timing will only occasionally match up with our timing. For example, we may see our need as riches or advancement in this world, but I reckon, I reckon and I've lived in this, that there are times when God knows that what we truly need is a time of poverty, a time of loss, or a time of solitude. And when this happens, oh man, we are in good company. God loved both Job and Elijah, but he allowed Satan to absolutely hammer Job all under his watchful eye. And he let that evil woman Jezebel break the spirit of his own prophet, Elijah. But I don't want us to miss the fact that in both of those cases, in the lives of both of those men who went through so much, God followed those trials with restoration and sustenance as promised. So these negative aspects that can happen in the kingdom, they run counter to the heresy that continues to influence way too many people around the world. This so-called 
prosperity gospel that we hear so much about. False teachers are still gathering followers under the message, God wants you to be rich. But that philosophy is not the counsel of Scripture. And it is certainly not the counsel of Matthew 6.33, where Jesus said, Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Now, folks, that is not a formula for gaining wealth. It is a description of how, exactly how, God works. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, live righteously, and he will supply everything you need. So Jesus taught that our focus should be shifted away from this world, its promise of status, and its lying bait to hook us on all the shiny things that it has to offer us, and placed on the things of God's kingdom instead. And the kingdom of God is simply the place where God rules and where God reigns. And so when Jesus says that the kingdom is near, what he means is that his rule or reign is at hand, that you are going to see what God's kingdom looks like in the life and ministry of Jesus. And as I've said many times, a response is expected when the king comes to reign. That is, one should turn away from their old way of life. We call that repentance to embrace the reign and the rule of our coming king. Now, one way I've heard this kingdom business described that was helpful to me, I heard this years ago, and I, it was helpful for me, and I hope it will be helpful for you as well. I think it helps to think about the kingdom of God in the same way that we think about the seasons. Summer, spring, fall. And here's what I mean. I've spent a this is the first place I've ever lived in my life where it didn't snow a lot. <laughs> and so I've spent a better part of my life living in places that were cold and the snow piled up deep in the winter. That's, that's been mostly where I've lived. And in those places, when the month of March and April comes along, even though it's officially spring, it really does not feel much like spring. Cold winds continue to blow, and the temperatures are still often very chilly. Spring is here. It has been inaugurated, but it is yet fully consummated. You have to wait for the sunshine, and you have to wait for the warmer winds. You have to wait for the birds to begin to sing and the flowers to begin to bloom. You know it's coming because spring has arrived, but you got to wait. In short, spring has come, it has arrived, and yet it is still coming. And that is where we are with the kingdom of heaven. It has been inaugurated, but it has yet to be consummated. It has come, but it is still coming. And so the kingdom of God is simply the place where God rules and reigns. For now, that is in your heart and in my heart, if we will allow it is in our actions and the way we treat other people. It has been inaugurated, but it is not yet fully consummated. It has arrived and its completion is a sure thing, but we are not yet able to experience all of its coming fullness. Now, because we as Christians are still waiting for the consummation of God's kingdom, what we need to consider is, what does that kingdom look like now? in its present state before it's fully consummated? What does it look like in this phase that we are in, the church has lived in for the past 2,000 years or so, the time during which Jesus is reigning, yet we still await the full consummation of his kingdom? We don't have, to look at, we don't have time to look at all of that this morning because that's a lot to unpack. Uh, but what I want to encourage you to do, I'm going to give you a little homework assignment. I want you to go home this afternoon. I want you to read in the book of Mark, chapter 1. I want you to read verses 14 to 39. Mark chapter 1. I'll wait for you to write that down because I know you're dying to get home and do this. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 39. And here's the reason I'm directing you there. What you will see in that section of Scripture 
is a window into what the kingdom looks like. And you will see aspects of its presence in the ministry of Jesus. For example, in that passage, you will see the gospel proclaimed. You will see the calling of disciples take place. You will see some authoritative teaching and learning going on in there. You'll see spiritual and physical healing take place. And you will also see in that section opposition to the advancing kingdom. All of that, you'll see it if you read that and look for it. That is a picture of what the kingdom currently looks like. And so all of that to say the kingdom of God is not something entirely invisible. It's not something out there somewhere that we cannot see. But it is actually something that we can see at work in the everydayness. I'm making that word up. The everydayness of our lives. It might not look spectacular at every moment. It is faithfulness in the ordinariness of life. And that's good news to me because... The truth of the matter is, life is pretty much, most of the time, ordinary. (laughs) And so its completion has been a long game, to say the least. And if you're a new believer, or you're simply here because you're curious about all this, we're really glad you're here. But here's my challenge to you. Commit to attending church and pursuing your knowledge of Christ and His kingdom, and do that for a year. Holy cow, a year? Yeah, just just do it for a year. Because here's the reason. It's not very often, it happens, but it's not very often that you will see the impact of the gospel on yourself or someone else in a single day. You'll see glimpses. You might see some. But it's when you start to hang around for a while and you start to get involved in smaller groups of like-minded people who are in here this morning. And when you do that, there's a good chance you will see the kingdom advancing in the lives of people who are sitting around you right now. It's a long game, folks. But man, is it a good game to be in. Now, this is a challenge to church members, too. You're not off the hook. We need to be a people shaped by the gospel. We need to take opportunities to share in one another's lives so that so that our neighbors might see the kingdom advancing personally within us and also through us. Let's let them see, as Paul puts it, that it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Let's let them see that in us. Now, that's just a little, a little tiny picture of the kingdom. And we're going to say more about this in the weeks to come. But that, that just gives you an idea. Now, what about discipleship in the context of this kingdom that we're called to participate in? I want to begin that discussion with a look at a few of Jesus' final words with his disciples recorded for us in Matthew chapter 28. You've read this a thousand times if you're a student of scripture at all, but we're going to come back and have a look this morning. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. It says, Jesus came and he told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given to you. And be sure of this, be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now let's break that down a little bit. Jesus told his disciples, number one, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Now that word authority is a Greek word that actually means power of choice or liberty to do as one pleases, okay? Uh, We don't have that, by the way. You're going, dang it. (laughs) This is what was given to Jesus. It said, he has been given the liberty to do as he pleases. He has the power of choice over all things in heaven and on earth. And so Jesus is saying, I have been given. Now what's that imply? The implication is some higher authority that gave it to him, right? Namely, the Godhead. 
which is the persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in other words, all the persons of the Godhead have agreed that Jesus should be granted say over everything in heaven and on earth. Now, how many would agree that all things in heaven and earth would be pretty inclusive? Nothing left out of that, is there? Nothing left out. He has say over everything that is. Authority over things seen and things unseen by our human senses. It is a complete and utter authority. So Jesus is telling his disciples, he's telling those of us on this side of the narrow gate, I have say over all, so what I'm about to tell you carries the full weight and the full authority of the one who created it all. And so knowing that, Jesus says, here's what I want my disciples to do. Go. And it, it really carries the idea of as you go is the best way to understand this. It means you don't have to travel to some specific place or some far off land in order to do this, though that may be what he will lead you to do. But this is more the idea of as you live your day in and day out life in the midst of your everydayness, Jesus wants you to do what? Make disciples. That is, make apprentices to me, Jesus says. Not apprentices to you, that's important, but apprentices to Jesus. To always have our own eyes and always be pointing others to gaze upon Jesus Christ. Who are we to do this with? Jesus says, all the nations. Among people of every kind, Jesus referenced here in that day, and specifically he was referencing all Gentiles, all non-Jews, okay? But so that, that is where, that's the where and the who. But how? How do we do this, Jesus? How do we make these disciples? He tells us, number one, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That kind of seems out of order when you think about it, doesn't it? I mean, don't we baptize people after they accept him as their Lord and Savior? Well, some would say, yeah, he's just implying that that's. But, but some would say this is a, re a reference to water baptism, the actual act of baptizing and submerging people in water. I happen to think it goes even further than that. I think what Jesus is telling his disciples is that discipling someone else is to submerge them in the reality of the Trinitarian God. Get them wet if you want to. That's, that's important. I'm not taking that out of there. I'm adding to it. And I know there's a warning about not I don't add to Scripture, but I'm going to do that here. Jesus' instructions are to submerge them in what? He doesn't say water. He says, no, not first. He says, submerge them and pass on his teachings about the reality of God and the ways of the kingdom of heaven. And finally he comes the promise. He says, listen, I'll be with you always, always, always until this age ends. In other words, until the job is complete. What job? Disciple making. So if we're going to make disciples, which seems to be the only job here that I see Christ left us to do, then I guess we would need to know what we're making and how will we know when we've made one? <laughs> now we have a, we've, we've talked about this working definition of what a disciple is. I've mentioned this a few times in this series. Uh, discipleship is the process of devoting oneself to a teacher to learn from and become more like that teacher. And in our case, that teacher, of course, is Christ. So there have been literally volumes, hundreds of hundreds of volumes written on what a disciple is, but if you're going to make a disciple, you really kind of need to nail that down. That working definition seems pretty simple, and it seems pretty straightforward. But I want to throw a little more weight to it this morning. You've heard it said that there is no perfect church. Anybody ever heard that? My pastor that I sat under for years used to tell us, you know, there's no perfect church. And if you ever do find one, please, please, please don't join it because you'll wreck it. We just did a series of messages on the book of 1 Corinthians, if you recall. 
That was a letter written to a first century church that was less than perfect (laughs) by a lot. And what we saw was that the primary reason that church was having problems, almost every problem they had, was because there were people in that church, selfish people, that instead insisted on having their own way. I cannot think of a greater cause for church splits than this one thing, selfishness. Always needing to be right to the exclusion of all others. We see it happening in the world today where people can't even have their own opinions anymore without being labeled an oppressor and the sworn enemy of those who disagree with them. We see it in the world. We should expect to see it in the world. But unfortunately, we also see it in the church. It's nothing new, but we continue to fail to learn the lessons that Paul taught to that first century church. But here's where the weightiness of discipleship comes to bear. I'm going to make a statement that I, with all my heart, believe is true. And I'll I'll give you scripture over the next little while to, to shore it up, to back it up. We hear a lot of complaints today about the church, yes? It's almost like this background noise constantly going on. Oh, what's the matter with the church? What's wrong with the church? There's been books written. What is wrong with the church? Well, you will be thrilled to know this morning that this pastor knows the answer. So you can all be comforted knowing that of all the church congregations with pastors and elders, you all belong to the church whose pastor knows exactly what's wrong with the church. That should give you great comfort. It also make you go, Lord, help that preacher. I'm going to be even bolder. Not only do I know what's wrong, I know how to fix it. Well, it's not my original idea, but I found the answer. You ready for it? Everything, big capital letters, everything that is wrong with any church, everything that is wrong with this church is because of a lack of discipleship. I'll let that sit for a minute. That wasn't even the weighty statement. That's coming next. Here's the statement I promised. There is not one thing wrong with the church today that discipleship would not cure. Pretty bold statement. I'm going to say it again. There's not a single thing wrong with the church today that a good, strong discipleship system would not cure. I believe it's true. Scriptures confirm that it's true. And even Jesus himself believes it is true. And we see that in the marching orders he left us with. Of all the things he could have said, of all the last instructions he could have gave his disciples, what did he ask him to do? What did he ask him to do? Make more disciples. That was the most important thing for him to share as his last marching orders to his his guys. Make more of you. Folks, if we do not get discipleship in the mix here at LFB, then the best that we can possibly hope for this side of the last church split this church had is we will be creating another church with all the same problems we had before. I've heard story after story of unhappy people ready to get rid of the church. But what they all end up doing, when you hear stories about people, I'm leaving the church, I'm starting a new church, I'm going to do something different. All they end up doing is they go out and they don't, they don't talk about discipleship, they just, they just talk about having a different kind of service or maybe a different way of preaching or maybe a different style of music. And that's all fair enough. But if what they're doing does not include a serious push for discipleship, then what they're going to end up with is just another organization with the same kind of human problems that the present church has. Discipleship is the thing that will fix it. Most of the things that cause trouble in churches shouldn't even be in churches. I'll give you an example. For example, who's mad at who? Anybody mad at anybody in here this morning? I know you're not going to raise your hand. 
Folks, I'm real serious. That should never be in the church. And when it is, when it is, you can be sure that apprenticeship to Jesus Christ is not at the center of it. Self is the most likely culprit. Jesus said, make disciples to him. Make apprentices to him. Make students to him. Not make everyone do what you want them to do. Not make every effort to convince others to see things your way. That's not what he said. He said, make students of me. Make disciples. And throughout church history, that, that has happened. And I can tell you, if you've studied church history at all, when a certain individual or some individuals stand up and start taking discipleship seriously, the results, they always varied in terms of intensity, but you can be sure that whenever the change to charge to make disciples and be disciples is taken seriously in the church, that has always, always, always marked the high points in the history of the church. And the people who have done it, that is, make disciples, were themselves very serious disciples. And that's how this thing has to work. It can't work any other way. There is no such thing as a significant and long-lasting movement whose call was to come and be nominal Christians. That won't amount to anything. So it is very important that we understand this. Jesus' charge was to make people an apprentice to him. People of all kinds, no social or political distinctions or other kinds of cultural distinctions, and to bring them into the presence of God. The Trinitarian reality of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Get them wet if you want to, but the focus Jesus has is to bring them into the presence of the triune God and from there teach them everything that we have learned from Him. That's the plan. And by the way, that plan works. Every single time it's done, it works. Make disciples. Now, in churches today, it is up to, in, in a large part, it is up to pastors and elders and teachers that you have in place in your church, whether or not they're going to do that, make disciples, or something else. Jesus did not call us to make Christians. He sure didn't say, go make more Baptists. It's okay, as long as those Baptists are disciples. It's okay, as long as those Christians are disciples. If we are all disciples... Everything will take care of itself. I've said it before, and I'm always astounded at the fact that, last time I checked, it could be a bigger number now, but we have some 40,000, 40,000 denominations of Christian churches. We all have the same mission statement. We all have the same church growth plan. Why are there 40,000 different ones? Matthew 28, 18 through 20 that we just read should be both our mission statement and our church growth plan. That's the whole thing. So when we look at people who were disciples in Jesus' day, as we've already established, an apprentice was someone who was learning from him how to lead a life in the kingdom of God as Jesus himself would lead that life if he were me. That sounds backwards, don't it? Think about that for a minute. If I'm a disciple, I am with him in all of my circumstances, learning to be like him. Now, I don't want you to miss the focus that in that statement. It's my life, not his life. Why is that important? I know you guys think, that sounds like heresy. Just stay with me. Why is that important? Because what we are learning is how to live our life in the kingdom of God as it is now, as Jesus would lead my life if he were here being me. Does that make sense? Does it? You see, we think, could he do it? Could Jesus actually succeed in the day and age in which we live? I mean, look at this mess we're in. Could Jesus actually do the things he did back then? And could he actually live my life and do it successfully in this messed up world that I live in? And the answer is, of course he could. Of course he can. 
And it's only if you believe that he could do that that you will be prepared to be his disciple. In everything you do, in everything you are, otherwise, otherwise, here's what's going to happen. Here's what you'll do with Jesus. You'll park him off in some special place, and you'll walk off. Now, I've said that it has occurred to us, your elders, that we keep asking you to get involved in the disciple-making process. If that is what we want you to do, then we had better have a process for you to get involved in, yes? (laughs) There may have been one clearly laid out in the past of this church. I don't know. I haven't been here for that long. There may have been one, but here's what I do know. During the years of COVID and the things that happened during that time, we lost momentum in that regard so one of the things we're all thinking when i say all i'm talking about your elders all of us are thinking and praying about is how to get us back on track this series of messages was meant to be a starting place for that but i can tell you that i am only barely scratching the very tip of the iceberg here we want to and we are committed your elders are committed to go further with this but we're tr- and so becoming better disciples ourselves and helping you learn to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ so that you can help lead others to be disciples of Jesus Christ that's at the top of our list right now really because here's the thing who who is it that is teaching you to stop being judgmental and controlling of your fellow man who's teaching you that Who is it that's helping you to overcome the hurt and the pain and the shame in your life? Who's helping you with that? Who is it that's teaching you how to better love your neighbor? Are there any institutions out there that have a course for that? And if there isn't, why not? I'll tell you why not. Because the problems of the world still do, will always, until Jesus comes back and makes it right, The problems of the world will always come back to the doorstep of the church, and the church, in many cases, is failing her people. The church is not the kingdom of God, and the church is, and and the nation Israel has not been replaced by the church. Get that foolish idea out of your head if you have it there. But the church is an outpost in the kingdom of God. And the church's job is to extend the kingdom of God through its influence. And that influence should be primarily the transformation of the people who are there. You guys. If we focus on that, that will help us from making the big mistake of worrying too much about the people who aren't here. Stay with me. Those of you who are here are the ones that we can help the best. I can tell you over the years, folks, I have preached to a lot of empty chairs. I don't know. I don't know if any of those empty chairs ever got saved and went to heaven, but (laughs) I've preached to a lot of empty chairs. Worried about what was going on out there more than I was paying attention to what was going on in here. But with the limited time that I have left, I want to spend that time developing myself and equipping myself to better help and encourage the chairs that are occupied in this room every Sunday. I want to help you guys. That doesn't mean I don't care about the people of our community who have yet to walk through our doors. I do care about them. But I cannot help them to the extent that I can help you because they're not sitting here listening to me. You are. Yes, I have plenty of opportunities to plant seeds out there. In my every day-to-day stuff, I get to have those conversations with non-believers all the time. But planting seeds is about as far as I will go in most of those conversations. Discipleship's not really happening there. It's beginning, maybe. A seed has been planted. But it can happen here. It must happen here because there is no other place for it to happen. Shame on us if that is not our priority. So myself and the other elders are committing ourselves to see to it. See to it that you get the help you need to become a true disciple of Jesus 
if that is what you want. And beloved, I pray with all of my heart, that is what you want. This message is going to need a part two, so we're not going to get to all those other verses on the slide this morning. We're going to get to them next week, but I want to leave you with one of them as I close this morning. I'm going to, I'm going to read this slow. I want you to listen very carefully. This is coming out of the New Living Translation, in case you wonder. But here's what I want you to do as I read this. See if, as I read this, see if this is your experience at Lebanon First Baptist Church. And if it is not, I want you to be honest and ask yourself, how much of that lays at my feet? How much of the shortfall is my responsibility? So it comes from Colossians chapter 3. It's interesting, Sean mentioned Colossians this morning in one of the very verses I'm going to read here. I didn't pay him to do that. He was, apparently was listening to the same spirit I was listening to. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Listen to this, folks. Since God chose you to be the holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourselves with the tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anybody who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And all the people said, where else are you going to turn to learn how to live that way if not the church. If you're thinking that you can live the way that we just read in isolation and on your own, you are making a grave error in your thinking. We need each other, beloved. We need each other. Let's be a church committed to discipleship by being a people who spend time with Jesus regularly and consistently and gradually, with one another's help and encouragement from each other, and relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, gradually we become more and more and more like our Savior Jesus. And eventually, we begin to learn to live in the kingdom of people that does what he did in every situation and in every circumstance. We have to learn his ways in community. Because, guess what? His ways are not our ways. Amen? Let's pray. Father, today we are grateful to be, uh, number one, we're grateful to be your people. And I know there are many in this room this morning, Lord, who are grateful to be, uh, have been the objects of your love to the point where you pursued us and we responded and we are now doing our utmost to walk with you. Father, thank you for loving us into salvation. Thank you for the price that you paid so that our sins could be just gotten out of the ways. So we've got enough things that keep us from our time with you. Thank you that you took care of the sin issue. And Father, help us to put our faith and our trust in the fact that you have done that and to focus our attention on what you'd have us do now.
Now that we're redeemed, now that our sins have been forgiven, now what? Now we make disciples. Now we spend our time next to Jesus, learning him, learning about him, learning what he did, letting him teach us so that we, as we become better disciples of him, we can then lead others to be disciples. Father, we love you in this place. We know, we know, Lord, that we have far to go still. We know that we've made mistakes. God, help us to be more in tune with you than we've ever been. Help us to be that church. You know, people talk about churches all the time. Help us to be that church that when people look at us, they go, man, those people are serious about their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not legalistic, not a bunch of pain in people's sides, but that we just love the Lord Jesus enough that it becomes obvious in everything we do and say and think and act. Father, that's my prayer this morning for myself, my prayer for these beloved brothers and sisters of mine. God, that you would work in us and help us to be more like Jesus Christ. It's in his strong name we pray. Amen.